to Udacity Talks. I think it's our eighth so far. My name is Sebastian. I'll be your moderator. And this is all about bringing unbelievably exceptional warriors <laughs> <laughs> into our studio and pick their brains about the future and life. It's a great honor today. I have partner three warrior, Renee, with me. She's one of uh, Forbes magazine's most powerful 100 women <laughs> on the planet, which means she leaves about four billion other women behind. <laughs> <laughs> but she's also one of these iconic people here in Silicon Valley, having worked for many years at Motorola, uh, worked her way all the way up to CTO and executive vice president, having worked at Cisco for a long time, and now running a car company. See the car in the background here? Uh, an electric car company that has an office here in Silicon Valley with about 350 people and a partner company in China. It's a real great pleasure having you here. It's my honor to be here. Um, I enjoy talking about technology, but I love what you're doing, <laughs> you know, training the next generation workforce for us so that we can tap into the best brains in the world. That's good. Luckily, this is not about me. It's about <laughs> you. So I have to ask you questions. But our okay. format usually is I ask you a few questions up front, and then I have a lot of questions that our students submitted. And they're very curious. We did get hundreds of those, and I can't do a hundred, <laughs> but I can do a few of those, okay? So you are born and raised in India? Yes, that's right. And you got your technical engineering degree from India? Yes. And then what brought you over? I, so I was born in India. I went to school in India. I went and uh, did my undergraduation at Indian Institute of Technology in New Delhi. Good one. Um, and I studied chemical engineering, but my specialization wom was more material. So I was sort of always interested in new materials and how new materials are applied. Um, so I came to the U.S. to go to graduate school. I went to Cornell University, mm -hmm. and that's where I did. I actually started my Ph.D., but never finished it. Um, I left after I got my master's mm -hmm. um, to do research in polymeric materials. And at the time, uh, I was researching new materials for building semiconductors in mm -hmm. photoresist masking uh, in how you build uh, semiconductor devices. So I sort of branched off from materials into more solid state and semiconductor physics. And after I graduated, started my career in Motorola Semiconductor. As an engineer. As an engineer. And I always wanted to go back and teach. Uh, but once I started working, you know, I think the, the excitement of building new products and bringing those to market kept me uh, away from going back to finish my PhD and teach. I see. And then you kind of, I mean, if I may ask for the cliff notes of your life here, <laughs> you kind of made it from engineer to manager to vice president to executive vice president to CTO, which is a really big position in, in any company, in a major public trade company, and then eventually to CEO. Like Give me the summary of what that means. Yeah. <laughs> so I would say it's pretty boring. I think I've had a very boring career in the sense it's very linear and very, um, um, you know, I think maybe predictable. I wish I had like been in Hollywood for a year or done interior design and then worked in engineering. You know, I've been an engineer my whole life, uh, my whole career, I should say. So yeah, I started as a line engineer in semiconductors and then I became uh, Chief Technology Officer for Motorola Semiconductor. I started to enjoy leading people, teams of engineers who built things, and and then I started to really think about the business side of technology. So I went from being Head of Engineering, being chief, chief Technology Officer, to running a business at Motorola. I actually ran a lithium-ion battery business. Um, at the time, Motorola was building mo you know mobile devices and cell phones, and we built our own batteries. So I ran that business for a while which had, you know, that back then it was really all about operations. How do you build batteries that were cost effective with good margins? So I learned the business side of technology. Then I became chief technology officer for Motorola. And we did the Razor. I don't know if you remember the yeah, Razor. Yeah, oh God, of course, the flip phone. Yeah, yeah, it was, uh, yeah it was really the it. first time a device had a name and a personality. Yeah. You also did Android, right? You started Android on That's Motorola. right. I actually started the Android partnership with uh, Google when I was at uh, Motorola. Then I left Motorola and came to Cisco mm -hmm. as the chief technology officer, ran worldwide engineering for Cisco. Then I became chief strategy officer, and I was doing investments uh, for Cisco and working a lot with startups and buying companies and bringing them into Cisco. Then I kind of got the startup bug. You know, I think I was on the other side as an investor for Cisco, investing in startups. And I saw all the passion these entrepreneurs had for building companies. So I left Cisco in um, September of 2015, thinking I wanted to do something on my own. I didn't really know what I wanted to do. I wanted to go 
do something that would change in industry. I felt both at Motorola and at Cisco, I participated in changing the course of a company and mm -hmm. brought the companies into new spaces. When I left Cisco, I was looking to go to an industry and kind of shift the whole industry and create a movement in a new direction. Um, and so I was thinking either education actually or, or transportation. Those were the two verticals I was researching. That sounds like very related. <laughs> <laughs> and then uh, I, found I met familiar. the founder of NEO and uh, started as the very CEO. Nice. Yeah. Very, very nice. Yeah. Is there any advice you would give you to your younger self back in India? You know, I think um, the advice I would give myself is perhaps when I was younger, I was a little bit risk avert. I mean, not it was not risk in the sense I think I stayed in my comfort zone um, for longer than I should have. You know, So the advice I would give myself is to perhaps branch out sooner than I did, meaning I was in engineering for a long time in my career until very recently. Um, and it's, it's because I enjoy technical things and I enjoy being pretty hands-on as an engineer. But I wish in, as a younger person, I would have tried different disciplines perhaps and got more exposed to So you're to doing it now, I guess. <laughs> <Yeah>. <laughs> I am doing it now. Do you now. feel less fearful, <laughs> less constrained today? Yes, now I'm much more confident in myself in what I do. I'm still That's an engineer great. at heart, but uh, building a company requires mm. lots of different skills. I have to say I'm really intrigued to have you as a role model here in Silicon Valley. I think one of the things that Silicon Valley lacks, especially in engineering, is diversity. And mm -hmm. something that you does say is really important to us is diversity in our student body, in our employee base. Because uh, I think if you are more diverse, you could actually be a much better place. So mm -hmm. thanks for being a great role model. Well, thank <laughs> you. That's very kind of you. So I have a few questions that our students ask. And the way it usually works is I'm the spokes organ for our students, and they submit those. Okay. And then um, in advance, um, <laughs> I, I will mispronounce some of the student names, which is very common here. <laughs> uh, the first one is going to be really hard. Um, Svar, uh, Svarna Govri asked a question. Uh, congratulations for all the accolades and recognition. Is Neo planning a self-driving electric car? Yes, we are. Are you working on it right now? Yes, we are. Are you hiring? Yes, we are. Anybody out there uh, up for hires? Please come work for us. What type, <laughs> skills, what type of skills are you hiring right now? Everything, practically. So I started last year, about just about a year ago. We were 15 people. Now we have over 300 people. Okay. We have offices in San Jose and San Francisco. Uh, we are hiring in autonomous driving team, everything from machine learning, controls, firmware, hardware, uh, sensor fusion, all different if kinds of like expertise. If you were like an engineer, say the machine learning or sensor fusion, what are the typical salary levels as an entry level <laughs> salary? <laughs> we'll negotiate once they start. <laughs> we're very competitive, you'd be surprised. And because we're a startup, you know, there's a big wealth creation opportunity for all your engineers. So you give everybody equity and so we on? We give everyone Okay, equity. so students listen up. Um, <laughs> and Adam, how far has your team progressed? Where do you drive these days? Uh, so we have a permit in, uh, we are one of the few com few startups that I say have the permit to, in to test, test in uh, California. We have test vehicles, we're developing the software um, and testing it, you know, so we're making good progress. Okay. And we're in parallel building a car as well. So we are also working on the vehicle engineering side. We are hiring even people interested in building cars, mm. mechanical engineers and electrical engineers working on powertrain or batteries and yeah. So we have a car team and we have a software team and we're bringing the two worlds good, together. Good, 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 good. Sounds, sounds, sounds great, honestly. A topic <laughs> very close to my heart. Uh, Nitya is asking a question. It's obvious that autonomous vehicles are no longer a future vision, but more of a current reality. Given that, as a vehicle manufacturer, what do you see the next moonshot idea for the transportation sector will be beyond self-driving cars or electric cars? Yeah, that's a great, uh, great, great question. So I think if you think of like a moonshot, meaning something that we all dream would happen and perhaps would take maybe years to happen, right, is how do you actually shrink the time to travel? So for example, when we had, before airplanes, when we had ships, it would have taken us, what, from LA to Tokyo would have taken us seven days or something like that, right, to get from, from there. Now in air travel, we've cut that down to about 12 hours. So let's say you know, half a day. Um, so could we do that kind of a distance in maybe um, you know, few hours, 12 hours? You know, today air travel is 12 hours, so could we do that in one hour? You know, so that would be something amazing to do. So I know Elon's working on Hyperloop as part of that, but what other technologies could we think about that cuts distance down and we've yeah. kind of made that kind of progress in communications, right? Actually, even when I came to the US as a graduate student, I remember writing letters to my mom back in India. 
and you know it's probably now that that whole art of letter writing is is dead uh, but imagine back then i would mail a letter it would take three days to go to india and if my mom replied it would take three days for me to get a reply back it was like seven days which is fast by historical it's standards fa fast <laughs> but, uh, but now it's instantaneous yeah. right with uh, whatsapp or wechat yeah. just talk almost real time so what is it that we could do like that for travel that would be moonshot so do you think that supersonic travel will come back then hopefully i don't know we know it's possible right There's we have to, to make lots of that, that lots of lots planes. of progress uh, but I think even, you know, if you say, okay, that's farther out, what would be maybe in the next 10 to 12 years, you know, I think beyond self-driving car, vehicle-to-vehicle -vehicle communication, communication with traffic lights, you know, would we have an ecosystem where things actually are talking to other things and mm. making our life easier? Uh, that's not so much of a moonshot. There is technology being developed yeah. already. For decades, I should say, right? Right. But perhaps th you know, making that a real thing would be something very exciting. Yeah. Yeah, that seems to be stuck a little bit, is my impression, to be honest. I think a lot a of it has to do with regulation and, problem, and yeah. standards, yeah. right? Yeah. Yeah. Uh, I mean, talking about self-driving cars, what fraction of your life is working on self-driving cars versus the other stuff, the electric cars and design? I mean, we cars? are all about self-driving cars, yeah. and so our, our focus is to build a self-driving car that people will buy. We're not a rideshare company, so we're mm. not developing cars for fleets. Um, you know, I'm, I believe that cars are those aspirational consumer products. It, it, it will continue to be uh, something that people will want to own. I think the problem today, and we've done a lot of research on this, we've asked people, what is it about your cars that you don't like? Uh, by and large, people say they like what they have in their cars, but they don't like what they do in their cars. They're stuck in traffic. Whenever I say, driving what do you think of accident injury traffic pollution mm. so we want to remove those problems and uh, you know like i said i grew up in delhi new delhi yes and i just went back in december to give a talk uh, in new delhi and when i was a student there it was like very very common that in the winter time uh, the skies were blue and we would lie on the lawns of the university and just gaze at the skies and periodically do our homework but now, you know, this time when I went to Delhi, the skies were so polluted and, and they've shut schools on a regular basis yeah. where children can't go outside to play. Um, you know, so I think to me, electric vehicles and what we can do with self-driving electric vehicles solves problems like this for millions of people around the world. And mm -hmm. so that's, that's our aspiration. Great. Oluva Femi is his name or her name, uh, asked a question, how do you think developing countries, especially Africa, and to some extent, I mean, the, the Indian subcontinent countries can catch up with some of the advanced technologies. What's mm. your recommendation for young, smart people living in those areas? I think this could be one of those things, you know, hey, I worked in the mobile communications world when developing countries actually leapfrogged fixed internet and went directly to the mobile internet, right? Um, and both India and China have done that. And, you know, there's a lot of innovation that happened there. Uh, a lot of places in India, people may not have internet connection but they have mobile internet and they use that <coughs> for commerce, for banking, for microloans. Uh, similar things could happen in mobility, right, where people would skip performance internal combustion engines and go directly to electric, electric vehicles as the costs come down. It would be better for the environment. And I mean, actually, I should say this, we are a global startup. We have a sister company in China that's working on EVs for the China market. And I was just in India actually exploring the potential for EVs and self-driving cars in India. Actually, if we can put a self-driving car in India, we can probably put it anywhere in the world <laughs> <laughs> because people don't follow rules at all in India when they drive. It's funny. I, um. I, I studied a little bit in India, and I, I think there are rules. And I think <laughs> they're, they're in my uh, like Western interpretation, they relate to the size of the vehicle. Like the yeah. bigger you uh, are. And how loud you are with yeah. your horn. <laughs> uh, but it's so fascinating. So your bus, you go first. If you're a bicyclist, you go last. Exactly. <laughs> uh, but the point is that the world is continuing to urbanize, yeah. right? Yes. By 2030, McKinsey says 60% of the world will live in urban cities. So people mm. will continue to f flog to these cities that are going to get, uh, if we don't do anything about it, they'll get more crowded, more congested, traffic will get worse and create more pollution. I think to me, one big part of this answer is self-driving electric vehicles, where yes. you don't need to live in the center of the city to work there. So you don't believe in flying cars yet? I'm, I'm all for them. I think I'm actually a big believer in something that I call autonomous economy. I think mm -hmm. we'll shift to a lot of these things being more autonomous, delivery systems, so you know, flying cars, drones, um, self-driving cars. I think all of this will change, just like the mobile internet, right? Mm -hmm. You know, when we first 
moved from sm cell phone to a smartphone, mm. nobody really imagined it would change so many other industries, but it did. And you know, and I was at on the other side. I was at Motorola at the time with a razor, I guess. Right? With a razor, <laughs> and you know, lo, lo and behold, Apple comes with the iPhone, and they didn't. They're not just a phone company. They created the mobile internet. Yeah. Um, so similarly, we want to be that company that leads to this autonomous economy. Nice. Um, President McCarran, uh, how important was the rapid innovative design, engineering, and R&D capability of UK-based uh, Motorsport Valley, a company such as RML or Alcon, which I actually don't know, in helping you achieve the full stunning potential of your flagship EP9 hypercar? Yeah, so RML was our partner yeah. um, on the EP9. It is, I mean, to me, design is extremely important. Mm -hmm. uh, to me, really, uh, I call this car 3.0. I think it's a sort of car 3.0, right, which is a autonomous electric vehicle, helps us redefine everything. So we have a design team in Munich. That's, uh, that's our car design team. Um, you know, kudos to them. I think, to, although they are traditional car designers, they are totally rethinking what the car of the future will be. Mm -hmm. So, when today's cars are mostly optimized for the driver, and when you take the driver of the out of the equation, you have to focus on the interior design as much as you currently focus on the exterior design. So, design and styling actually have to change too. So, design schools, um, where car design is one uh, one of the biggest disciplines in most design schools traditionally focus a lot on the exterior design, now have to shift that focus. Um, and then partners like RML who worked with us on EP9, so people ask me, why did we build a supercar? Yeah. You know, it's, it's very expensive, it's not really for everyone. Uh, the reason we built it is to prove the point that electric vehicles can have amazing performance. Yeah. And yeah. we now hold the record for being the fastest electric vehicle. That's amazing. Um, in the Nürburgring, I guess. In, in, in Nürburgring, as well as in France, in uh, Paul Ricard's uh, track. Very nice. And so, and yeah, we couldn't have accomplished without uh, partners working with us, but we also had a lot of engineering innovation from our side that we brought to it. That is great. There are some questions that are more like career-based. Uh, so Robert asked, what do you think a few characteristics you believe a person needs now and in the near future to be successful? Oh, this is a great question. <laughs> and I actually say this to I'm glad you say that. The, the people <laughs> it's that a complicated I, question. I, 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 uh, I think mm -hmm. to me, the biggest skill you need to have these days is curiosity. Um, curiosity to learn and explore and because you know the, the company I'm building, right? We have 300 people. Um, we have mechanical engineers, we have electrical engineers, low voltage electrical engineers, people that understand grid and high voltage systems. Uh, we have uh, uh, battery chemists, we have operating sys people who understand operating systems, software applications, data scientists. Mich so it's like a university almost, right? And so, and we all sit together and everyone has to work together. So the biggest strength that I look for when I hire people is are you curious to learn? Because no one's figured this out, we're all figuring this out. Um, and the other thing I tell people is, if you're coming from another company, I don't need your experience, I want your knowledge. Um, and I think it's a mistake people make, especially if you spent you know, years working in another company and you're coming to a startup or you're coming to a new space. Um, people, an experience to me means you do what you've done before. You ten, you know, tendency would be that I did this at BMW, I did it at Ford, I want to do it again. And typically that won't work because that's not what we're trying to do. Um, and so I tell people I want the knowledge that you've gained from your previous work, but you, you have to think of complete something completely different. Interesting. So, so curiosity, the ability to learn, uh, the ability to really work as, as a team. And I don't mean like that in a very cliched way. Everybody talks about teamwork. At the end of the day, in a startup, you have to make tough decisions, and so somebody's opinion is going to get ruled over, and we have to go. Um, but the ability to to be comfortable with ambiguity and listen to another person's point of view, I think these are things that I look for. How do you, how do you interview for that? Like when you get a new person in? Yeah, so you know what? I actually handpicked the first 150 people in my company. Um, and uh, literally everybody from our lobby ambassador to my VP of autonomous driving, we, I interviewed everyone. And the reason that was important to me is the first 100 people hire the next 1,000 people, right? And so you want to set the bar high and you want to set the certain expectation of what right. you're looking for from them. And so you, I ask all kinds of questions about what do you do when you're not working? Uh, how do you spend, how do you like to spend the time that you relax? Do you relax? Are you always working? What are important to you? I mean, I love cooking when I'm Me not too. working. 
And I mean, why do I love cooking? I never follow a recipe, by the way. I don't know. I, I'm terrible at baking. I'm, I, I enjoy cooking. Because baking, you have to be yeah, ready. That's feedback, right? <laughs> 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 so I love to experiment. So I ask people these sort of questions. And so uh -huh. that, you know, I think gives you an insight about what makes them tick. So you want people who have an interesting non-professional life? Yes, absolutely. Life? So if they say, oh, I watch television, that's a uh, negative? That's the, oh, it depends on what television. <laughs> I see. <laughs> <laughs> okay, okay, good. Um, so good. the certain, actually, we, we have something that we call team, do at my company called team time. Mm -hmm. um, one Wednesday in a month, we take two hours out of our work time and we all get together. Um, and we do some activity. It could be some trivia about cars, trivia about technology, geography, some project together. And the intent is that, firstly, it's okay to take a break, even though you're working like incredibly hard. Mm -hmm. um, and then secondly, when you take a break, the idea is I don't want people to just stay in their silo. I want them to go meet other people. Um, if you're a software person, go talk to the mechanical engineer working on the car, try mm -hmm. to figure out what they're doing. So it sort of forces all, us all to get together. Yeah. Related is a question from Vidya. How do we trust when everything and everyone in the industry in the industry and new jobs are so new and uncertain? Yeah, it's another great question. You know, trust is a big, big uh, thing. You know, and it's uh, it's very hard to say. Do you trust someone or you don't trust someone? And I think sometimes we oversimplify it and perhaps overuse the word. Um, to me, trust is something. It is being transparent. The way you build trust, right? When things are ambiguous, is being transparent. And being comfortable with saying, I don't know, I have to go research that or I have to go find that out. Um, so in fact, one of the things I ask people in interviews is to test their ability to say, gee, I don't know the answer to that, uh, versus trying to make it up. And mm -hmm. if, if someone's trying to make it up, you know that they're insecure among with themselves. Uh, and that breaks trust, right? And so to me, um, I look for transparency and the way if you are transparent and if you expect the other person to be transparent, um, you build trust in an ambiguous em environment. Hmm. You obviously operate in the United States and Silicon Valley, but you have a partner company uh, in China. Mm -hmm. Tell us what the difference in the marketplace are, mm. difference in regulations for mm -hmm. the technology you're building. Yeah, yeah. So in the beginning when we started, we actually thought one team could build products for both markets, right? You know, we started, uh, we the, the China team started actually a year ahead of us in, in Silicon Valley, and they were looking at the China market, solely the China market. And when we started, we thought, okay, we could take their platform, their vehicle platform, add additional technology. We would be able to do that. But we found the markets are actually very, very different. In which way? Um, so China, you know, I think the consumers in general, firstly, EVs is it's the fastest growing market for electric vehicles and for cars in general. You know, I think a lot of people in China now aspire to own cars. So mm -hmm. the market is the fastest growing anywhere, anywhere in the world, and the government's actually forcing people to shift from ICEs to EVs, which is a great thing. Um, consumers, though, how they interact with technology is very different. It's much more icon-based. It's much more um, mobile-driven, right? You know, WeChat is huge as a platform, so you have to be able to integrate with that platform. Uh, there are no garages, for, um, by and large, in China. People don't have big homes like we mm -hmm. do uh, here. So if you're building an electric car, you know, here you have a Tesla I saw, and I have one. Same no. color. <laughs> same <laughs> very color, em actually. Very embarrassing. <laughs> Both put it at the same time, two exactly, red Teslas. Exactly, I pulled up right behind <laughs> me. Um, but, you know, I charge my car at home or at work, right? Yeah. And so in China, that's not possible. People don't have garages. You can't ca charge your car. So how do you give them the convenience of charging? Um, so there's very different constraints that you have to think about when you're thinking about the vehicle platform. Mm. Um, so the team we have in China, our sister company, is really focused on that market and that consumer. Um, and if you look at the U.S., the prob big problem we have is long commutes on highways, highway driving. 136 million Americans commute 30 minutes or so one way every day for yeah, work, it's right? It's almost an hour, yeah. Yeah, and I'm one of them. I commute 45 minutes one way to Each work. Way. Wow, it's I a live long in commute. Palo Alto. I work in San Jose. Um, so that's you know. So we have different problems. Which are really neighboring cities. <laughs> <laughs> right. If the distance is not that much, <laughs> but the traffic is terrible. Yeah. Um, so the constraints are different, and mm. and the needs are different. So. Mm. Um, this is why we actually have two different platforms now, and we share supply chain, we share a lot of the supplier ecosystem, uh, but the products are different. And I think this is one thing, by the way, uh, about the car that's different from an iPhone or a smartphone. 
uh, a car as a product, it matters who it lives with and where it is living. Is it living with a family of seven in Shanghai or New Delhi or Mexico City or is it living with a single guy in San Francisco? The kind of product needs are very, very different. Mm. Um, that's not the case with iPhone or smartphone, right? It's yeah. sort of like very different. Given what you just said, uh, you still don't believe that the future of cars will be transportation as a service, like ride sharing. I think ride because sharing. Some people believe that very strongly. Yeah, I think ride sharing will absolutely grow. Um, <coughs> I don't think it will replace ownership, right? And the example I use is just because we have Airbnb doesn't mean people don't buy homes. Still buy homes. We love living in that. You know, to me, car is an extension of a personal space. Um, and I think you know people leave stuff in their car. But you realize, I think in New York City, there's now more Uber rides than ownership car Sh rides. True, true. But New York City, always people use the subways. Right. I, I would argue that if you lived in Manhattan, you probably didn't own cars, even before Uber. P you took cabs or subways. Mm -hmm. um, and that's true in San Francisco, probably true in Chicago, you know, major cities. But like I said, majority of people would love to live in a bigger space outside of the city and drive to mm -hmm. work. And mm -hmm. I don't think that will need will go away. Mm -hmm. And the other thing I feel like owning mobility is sort of reflects us reflects on us as owning freedom, right? I think human beings equate mobility with freedom. For years we've been explorers. We always wanted to go places and discover new places. Mm. All that I think will be the basic desire. So if you have an autonomous car, you could uh, in effect make your own flight whenever you want. You can yeah. sleep in the car, right? Yeah. So you actually don't have a red eye anymore, but you can travel at night and sleep. That's nice, that's very nice. One last question for you. If you had a magic wand and could create any technology, what would you want to see solved? Mm. Okay, you're gonna laugh, but I would do disposable clothing. <laughs> Ask I me love it, 3D Biodegradable. Uh, clothes. I'm a fashion nut. I love. I love to be. I can tell. I love to be fashionable, but I hate buying so many clothes that after a while get out of fashion. You've heard about this company Rent a Runway. I know. I know. But you're still, you know, it's still things that are not biodegradable. So I would love to have these things that are beautiful to wear that you would wear, and after that they degrade biodegrade and then you get something else. Important to degrade after you wear them. Would you also <laughs> want would you also want uh, 3D printed clothing then that you say oh, tonight yes, when there's something yellow, yes, push a button absolutely. and half an hour later Yeah, yellow. yeah, that's kinda halfway there. Yeah. And I think I think there's an amazing opportunity to reinvent clothing in my opinion. And the yes. fact that we have our wardrobes full of old clothing is just I know and big, no big space waste. and then you feel guilty, then you give them away and then you feel bad you're giving outdated clothes to somebody. Yeah. It's sort of like so much of that will go away. All right. Padma, really, really great pleasure having you here. Thank and you. I've learned a lot from you, and I hope your students and uh, viewers also learned a lot. Uh, it's been a great pleasure uh, to run the eighth now of our Yudasi Talks, organized by our very own Shanaz. Um, <laughs> I'm asked to remind all viewers that uh, Yudasi Intersect is coming up in March. Please check our website and come attend, because you get to see amazing leaders, including Astro Teller and I believe Tony Fidel and many others. Um, I'll see you all in March, and for the next Yudasi Talks, please stay tuned. We announce the next speaker soon on our website. Thank you. Thank you. Great. Thank you. That was fun. Thank you.